Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force. This is the fourth hangar. And today we're, rep we're actually celebrating the 50th anniversary of Apollo 15. And that was actually an ongoing mission right now. Uh, this day, uh, 50 years ago, Apollo 15 had already landed, had, had already done two EVAs or traverses with the rover. This was the third and final EVA or traverse of that mission on this day 50 years ago. That's uh, pretty cool. So we're going to celebrate that. And uh, as a matter of fact, we have the mission patch there and here. But if you look at the mission patch, and you might be wondering, what, what does that mean? <laughs> What's that design? Well, those three shapes there, red, white, and blue, are stylized falcons, because of course, the falcon is the Air Force mascot. Those represent the three crew members. And if you look at the lunar surface, illustration there, and if you're really sharp-eyed, you may see the Roman numeral 15 in the lunar features. So that's, that's kind of a cool uh, addition there. So I have subtitled this presentation, Exploration at Its Greatest, and if you're not familiar with the source of that quotation, you will be in a few moments. So there's three things I want to talk about today. Uh, number one, we want to lay a little bit of a foundation, kind of a historical context for Apollo and what Apollo was trying to do. And we want to talk about the mission objectives for this mission. We also want to go kind of delve into the history of the lunar rover, its origin, <coughs> if you will, and its development, and then its deployment on this mission. And then finally, we're going to talk about the mission details of this mission. We've got some uh, really neat photos, too. So before we get into that, I do want to kind of add something about myself, and that is that I was in the U.S. Air Force myself, so I, I really love being here, but I served uh, on active duty from 83 to 87 in both uh, Strategic Air Command and Pacific Air Forces. So while I was at Strategic Air Command at Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota, I pulled security on Minuteman missiles, and so I was a missile security specialist, and then I was... Uh, privileged, I guess, <laughs> to uh, serve at Osan Air Base, Republic of Korea, and at that time I was just a security specialist. So that uh, badge there is what I would have worn. So this gives me great pleasure to be down here at this museum. So Apollo gets started really conceptually probably about 1960, uh, but it was not really till 61 that Apollo formally, I guess, began to exist. But nonetheless, the planners decided on a list of missions and they designated them with alphabetic letters depending on their mission objective. So Apollo 11 was the G mission and that was the landing demonstration. But Apollo 15 is the J-1 mission. That is the first J mission. The J missions were the extended exploration missions. Now Apollo 15, the all Air Force crew, but Actually, the second all-Air Force crew, Apollo 9, was the first all-Air Force crew. So nonetheless, we can say that it was an Air Force crew. However, it's also sometimes called the all-Michigan crew. Now, i got to tell you, I'm from Ohio, okay? I'm a Buckeye fan. So this does not please me, okay? But, but I'm, going to, I'm going to share this. <clears throat> you got to give Michigan its due. This is uh, kind of what we deal with uh, as Buckeyes. Sometimes we got to face the facts. <laughs> So Michigan uh, has provided us with some astronauts, and in addition, we'll see kind of what their connection was, these, these men uh, on the crew. So the mission objectives, <clears throat> what is it we want to accomplish on Apollo 15? Well, we've got a list of objectives, and one of them is to explore the Hadley-Apennine region of the moon. You may not have heard of that before, but that is simply a mountainous region that is north of the equator and just slightly east of the prime meridian, in a mountain chain called the Apennine Mountains at uh, Hadley Rill <clears throat> and Mount Hadley. And we will see kind of where that looks, uh, where, where that is on the moon here in a minute. <clears throat> they also want to set up and deploy and activate surface experiments. And there were more experiments on this mission than of course there were in some of the earlier missions because this is a longer mission. And then we also want to make engineering uh, evaluations of some new equipment and uh, those two primary new pieces of equipment are one the rover roving vehicle and the new improved Apollo suits the A7LB suits which 
I'm sort of standing in, right in the way, right? So my parents used to say that I made a better door than a window. I think that's probably true. So anyway, if you want to, after the presentation, get up here and look at this replica of Dave Scott's suit. This is different from the say, suit that Neil Armstrong, for example, wore. So there's some new equipment and, some, and a new vehicle, so they're going to evaluate those. And then also they want to keep the command module pilot busy while he's up in lunar orbit. They don't want him to be up there playing solitaire and eating peanut butter sandwiches. Uh, they want to have him do something productive. So he's going to do a lot of photographing and a lot of experiments while he's in orbit, while Dave and Jim are down playing in the dirt uh, on the moon. So start off with uh, the commander. So this is David Randolph Scott. And uh, he was born in June of 1932 in San Antonio, Texas. His father was a high-ranking Air Force officer. And he attends high school in Riverside, California, but his dad moves the family to Washington. This is where Dave graduates high school. But then he decides he's going to go to engineering school, and he attends, where else? University of Michigan, okay? Boy, it pains me to say that. And uh, his freshman year, he does very well. His grades are so good that he is awarded honors uh, rank. However, West Point decides to invite David Scott to come. Now, those of you who've been in the military like me, you know that uh, that's not something that happens every day, okay? Most people apply to go to West Point, and West Point gets their application and looks at it and then quickly places it in the circular file, okay? Most people don't get invited to go to West Point. So Davey, <clears throat> I call him Davey because he's not here, uh, he is a very impressive student. So he actually graduates with his Bachelor's of Science, fifth in a class of 633 students. Is that impressive? I don't know, maybe, right? That might be. So a uh, pretty smart guy. So he chooses the Air Force because at that time there was no Air Force Academy. Okay, so you could choose if your grades were high enough. So he says, I'm going to go in the Air Force. I want to fly these fast movers. So he gets assigned to the 32nd Tactical Fighter Squadron in the Netherlands, and he's flying F-86s and F-100s. But this is not where his sights are really at. He, his sights are higher than this. He says, I want to be a test pilot. I want to push the limits. So he's able to get a, a couple of positions in test pilot school, and he does that. And then that's not good enough, so he wants to get a master's degree, so he goes to MIT and earns a master's in interplanetary navigation. I guess that's impressive, right? <laughs> he's just one of those mediocre guys, you know. Now, in 1963, he applies to be an astronaut, and they accept him. So in October of 63, David Scott becomes a NASA astronaut, and previously to this mission here, he has flown with Neil Armstrong on Gemini 8, and he has flown with McDivitt and Scott, or McDivitt and Schweikert, on Apollo 9. Okay, so he's a very experienced pilot by this time. Alfred Merrill Worden, he's the command module pilot, and he was born in February of 32 in Jackson, Michigan, another Michigan. Boy. But he left us in 2020, so last year he, bought, he died. But nonetheless, he went to high school in Jackson, and then he also attended West Point. So he graduated 47th in a class of 470. That's still upper 10%. And then he's assigned in an Air Force fighter squadron. He chooses the Air Force. So he's flying F-86s and F-102s, but like Dave Scott, that's not quite where he wants to end up. So he attends Aerospace Research Pilot School, and then he earns his master's in aerospace engineering at where else? UM, okay? Boy, that pains me to say that. <laughs> so anyway, Worden is accepted into Group 5 in, in 1966. And at the time of this mission, he is a space rookie. And then we have our third guy, and he is a rookie at this time. So James Benson Irwin, he's the lunar module pilot. And he's born in 1930 in Pittsburgh, Sadly, Jim Irwin became the youngest and the first of the moonwalkers to pass away, to leave us. He was only 61 years old, had a heart attack, and he died. So uh, he was uh, actually going to high school in Salt Lake City. He graduated from there. He decides to go to the U.S. Naval Academy, okay? And as I said, during this time frame, Air Force did not have an academy, so he chooses the Air Force. He becomes a test pilot, and then Jim Irwin is a test pilot for that airplane right there, the YF-12. Now, 
Now that's the fighter interceptor version of the SR-71, in case you're wondering because it looks very much alike, okay. So that's kind of a special uh, uh, privilege there. And then he also applies to be an astronaut and with Worden, Jim Irwin becomes an astronaut in 1963. Or sorry, 66. So nonetheless, he, as I said, is a space rookie. So now we're going to talk about the rover a little bit, the background of this uh, vehicle here. Now, long time before we went to the moon, many people had been, oh, I don't know, thinking about having ideas, uh, artistic renderings of a type of vehicle to be used on the moon. We hadn't gotten anywhere near trying to go there, but people were thinking, even back as, as far as 1901, what would a lunar vehicle be like? What, what kind of vehicle would we have to use? And so there were drawings and concepts, but really no serious concepts until 1959. And then, this is kind of surprising to me, the Army really was forward thinking. That's not something the Army is typically known for. So uh, the Army decides that if we ever put people on the moon, we need to have a way of moving them around. So they wanted a feasibility study. This is called Project Horizon. And uh, the guy who was going to be heading this up was essentially none other than Werner von Braun. So he is now the head of the Army Ballistic Missile Agency there in uh, Huntsville. And he appoints a fellow German, Heinz Hermann Kurla, as manager of this feasibility study. Notice this is not an operational project. It's just a number crunching what if. Do we have the money? If we had the money, how would we try to do this? So they're just doing research. So for this project, the Army Transportation Corps is going to work hand in hand with General Motors um, and General Motors uh, worked out of this research lab there outside of Detroit. So this is kind of the project that they're kind of number crunching, okay, early on. So Sam Romano, the guy up there on top is a GM senior engineer and he is directed by management of GM to ser search out and find this gentleman here, Dr. Becker, and he is a mechanical engineer but he specializes in soils and in mobility, off-road. How do you get certain kinds of wheels, tires, tracks to move a vehicle around in certain types of soil? And he has hired Ferenc Pavlix, who is a Hungarian immigrant. Becker was a Polish immigrant, so these guys brought their own unique uh, kind of thinking process. And so these three guys are working on this project to see how feasible is it, okay? But that project ends, it's shelved, they have some numbers, but that project is over. But in 60, Von Braun is appointed now as head of the new Marshall Space Flight Center. This is where the Redstone Arsenal was and is. And so this is now going to be a new office, if you will, a department of NASA. So Von Braun decides that he's going to get some engineers together and he says, look, I want you guys to study the moon. I want you to put together a portfolio of what the moon looks like close up so we can figure out can we go there and can we move around on it. So by the end of 1961, Project Apollo has become a real entity. It's a going concern, and they are starting to put out uh, budget, uh, budget uh, concerns and also bids, and their resources uh, are being allocated. Three years later, Apollo has a project within Apollo called MOLAB, Mobile Laboratory. Now, you see some design reviews. These are submissions from Grumman, from Northrop, and there were several others, one by GM, Boeing. And so what you have is a concept that initially began as a pressurized vehicle that would carry astronauts in a shirt sleeve environment. Well, this is a nice idea, but believe it or not, it got out of hand as far as cost and heavy. It was so heavy. The weight was just ridiculous. So one of those designs was actually 8,000 pounds on Earth. Now, if you're going to try to put something on the moon, you've got to have a separate launch just for that. It really is not practical, so they kind of had to uh, curtail that part of it. But while that's being you know, put on the shelf, they decide, look, we need to put some spacecraft in lunar orbit and land on the moon so, again, we can figure out what that terrain is like, what the soil is like, so we can prepare to go there. So the top picture is Lunar Orbiter, and that's the Earth above the moon. And then the bottom picture there is Surveyor 3. So Surveyor 1 landed in the ocean of storms after Luna 9 from the Soviet Union in the same year. They both soft landed. The Soviets beat us to the punch and they land softly Luna 9. So 
The previous spacecraft were basically crashing into the moon. So now this is kind of a step forward. But Surveyor is going to be the animal with which we ride into our new discovery of how to land on the moon because Surveyor is going to soft land, take soil samples, and we just happened to do something accidentally with Surveyor 3 that really proved very, very useful. So Surveyor 3, when it landed, it bounced. Didn't bounce very high, it just bounced. And what that meant was the photograph you see there of the foot pad there's an imprint of the foot pad, and the scientists could look at that and say, aha, the lunar dust is not very thick, and the surface must be quite substantial, very hard, very stable, so we can definitely plan to land some sort of craft on the moon, and maybe we can even drive a vehicle. So this was really important. Now, 67, later on in that year, GM approaches Boeing and they said, look, we've worked with you guys before. We have a concept for a rover, but we've changed our approach. So instead of having a pressurized, big, heavy vehicle, we're going to use an open Jeep type vehicle. This is going to be a lot better because it's going to be a lot lighter, smaller, and we might even be able to transport it to the moon, you know, instead of having Scotty bream it up there. You know, this is going to be a, a, an advance. So they approach Boeing. Boeing says, yeah, that sounds okay, we'll, we'll do that. So GM said, hey, how about you guys build, design and build the chassis and we'll work on the traction drives and the motors and that kind of thing. So there's a kind of a marriage of sorts. So this is what the GM team comes up with in terms of concept. This is a model. As you can see, it's probably about this big. It has a, a GI Joe on it, okay? So Ferenc, the... Uh, Hungarian immigrant is a just a brilliant brilliant engineer. He builds this model. It is battery powered, remote controlled and it folds up. The bottom photograph as you see it folds into a pie shaped space. Am I kind of like in your way there? Okay. So at any rate in March of 69 this GM team takes their little concept to Huntsville and they go into the main building and Werner von Braun is in his office and he's on the phone. So you can imagine, here is this distinguished guy, he's behind his desk, he's on the phone. These guys drive the rover into his office on the floor, okay? And he, he's sitting there talking on the phone and he says, uh, I'll call you back. He hangs up the phone. What have we here? And they come in and boy, they've got a sales pitch and they explain all about their concept and he is absolutely overwhelmed. He is so enthusiastic, he's fired up and he says, we must do this. We must do this. So the next month he establishes the task team and a month later the Lunar Rover Project becomes an official um, development program there at Huntsville at Marshall Space Flight Center. So it has become a reality. Now this gentleman here, Sonny Moria, was originally the project manager on the Saturn V F1 engine project. And he was so successful uh, that Werner von Braun decided to tap him to be the rover project manager. Now keep in mind, this guy was chosen for the F1 project when he was 28. That kind of makes my resume kind of look sick, you know? This guy was a brilliant guy. So he says to Doc, Doc, um, I'm a propulsion guy. I don't know anything about vehicles. Von Braun says, look, Sonny, you'll be fine. I, I have faith in you, you'll do just great. Sonny says, you can't say no to a guy like that. You know, you can't say no to him. So he is now the project manager for the rover at Huntsville, for NASA. Now in 69 October, Boeing gets the prime contract from NASA to build the rover. And they are, of course, located in Kent, Washington there. They still have a big plant there. So what a beautiful sight, huh? Like my little airplane? No? Yes? So this is the, the rover as it appears intact, okay, on the left. On the right, we have a kind of a busy diagram of the chassis, which of course Boeing is going to build. Now the chassis is built of aluminum 2219, and it is hinged. The front and rear are hinged. It will fold up over the center. The wheels will fold up over the center. It will fold into a five foot by five foot by three foot pie shape. And that's how they're going to get it to the moon. Like my birdie? Nobody likes my bird. You like your, okay. Somebody likes it, okay. So the rover is a little different than most vehicles, uh, as you can imagine. So for one thing, it's gonna use double Ackerman steering. 
Now, if you're not familiar with that term, Ackerman is the kind of steering your car uses, my car uses. So what that means is, if you have a vehicle that's going to turn to the right, let's say this one, the inner wheel has to turn to a larger degree. Now, why is that? That's because it has to trace out a smaller radius circle. If you do not have this kind of steering, and they didn't have until 1817, your wagon or whatever you had would skid when around a corner and they would often turn over. They would flip over. That's not a good thing. So when this was patented way back in the 1800s, uh, I think things got a lot better, <laughs> okay? We didn't have so many wagons turning over. So the Rover is going to use this type of steering, but it's going to have it in the front and the back. So it's four-wheel steering, not just four-wheel drive, okay? This is a kind of a nice uh, shot there. San, uh, uh, what's it called? Santa Barbara, California. Ugh. So this is where GM Delco was located, and GM Delco is going to build the traction drive, the suspension, the steering, the wheels, and the drive control electronics for the Rover. Remember, we said Boeing is going to build the chassis, and D GM Delco is going to build a lot of the other stuff. So I just had to put that in there. It's just a beautiful shot there. Now, GM Delco turns around, and they contract United Shoe Machinery Corporation in Wakefield, Massachusetts, to build what's called the harmonic drive. You can also call it a strain wave gear. We're gonna talk about that a little more. So this nice uh, picturesque uh, New England village there is Wakefield, Mass. And this company, as you see there, literally made shoes. They made shoes. And now they're gonna make something that is a transmission for the rover. So this is a diagram of what's called the harmonic drive. So the right side is a DC brush type motor, okay, electric motor, with a shaft coming over here, and on that shaft is something called a wave generator. It's like a cam assembly, and uh, that cam is going to rotate inside of something called a flexible spline, which is made of ink canal, which is super hard, made very thin, so when that wave generator rotates, that flexible spline will be deformed in an oval shape, and that flexible spline will then impact a circular spline outside of it, which is made of stainless steel, and we will see a picture or an animation of how that works. There are only three moving parts. Three moving parts. This is what it looked like from the end. The green is the wave generator, like a cam. The red is a flexible spline that deforms and allows the 158 teeth on the outside of it to mesh with the 160 teeth on the inside of the circular spline, which is the blue. This allowed an 80 to 1 reduction from the shaft speed of the motor to the wheels without a planetary gearbox, without a gearbox. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes my socks roll up and down. Well, they're a tough audience. They really are. You know, I had hopes about being in Vegas. I think those are shot now, okay? So anyway, this is a beautiful example of some of that incredible engineering that was brought to bear in the program that really addressed some major, major engineering challenges and did so with elegance and with, with brilliance. Just three parts. Amazing. Now the tires on the rover, those are not the tires that were used on the rover. Those are an ATV tires. We didn't have the money that NASA had, so... That's what we have. But the tires that went to the moon were zinc-plated piano wire. They were woven into a mesh, and this makes them very flexible, very uh, light, and self-cleaning. Now, the fenders were uh, fiberglass, and if you look at those chevrons, those are titanium chevrons that are riveted onto the mesh for traction. Brilliant design. Now, of course, if we're going to have a spacecraft or a vehicle or anything, you always have to have electrical power. You always have to power something. So in this case, we're going to drop back and fall back on some really tried and true technology. So Eagle Pitcher uh, in Joplin, Missouri, built the batteries for Project Mercury, Project Gemini, and the Apollo spacecraft. So we're going to use those batteries for our rover. There's a shot of Joplin, Missouri there. So the batteries were located in the front end, okay? Th these batteries are way bigger, way heavier. So those batteries were only 60 pounds a piece, and there were two of them only. They were 23 cell, 36 volt, 121 amp hour batteries. They were 
phenomenal batteries. The two of them together produced 8.7 kilowatt hours of power. That's not bad. They were not recharged. They never had to recharge them. So here's a shot of a lunar rover on the moon and the, the covers for the battery cases are open. After every time you stopped, you shut it down, you opened the battery covers, and this allowed the heat from the batteries and electronics to escape. Now, some of you might be thinking, wait a minute, this is a vacuum, how are you gonna let the heat escape? Well, there's, there's not two ways to get rid of heat in a vacuum, there's three. It, well, not in a vacuum. If you're, if you're trying to get rid of heat, you normally use either conduction or convection, or what's the third, what's the third way? I can't hear you. Exactly, radiation. So they didn't have to worry about conduction or convection. You can't because you've got, you're in a vacuum. So you radiate the heat away as infrared. So that heat escapes. And what happens when the electronics package cools off? There are three little containers in there containing paraffin wax. You want to talk about a low-tech solution that's elegant. So a small container of paraffin wax when it gives up its heat, it recongeals, ready for the next driving cycle because it absorbs a lot of heat. It's like water, it's a really good temperature buffer. Now if there's a simpler, more elegant way to do this, I don't know what it would be. It's, it's incredible, okay? Absolutely incredible. Now by 1970, the program was coming under some, some problems. They had some delays, they had some issues, they were struggling at some times, and so Boeing appoints Gene Cowart and says, you need to get down there and knock heads together because we are, we are losing ground here. And let's face it, here this, this is, it tells the story right here. When Boeing signed the contract with NASA, they had 17 months to produce the first flight rated model and deliver it. That's not very long, 17 months, okay? So they really were fighting the clock. Now the Russians, of course, in the meantime, had not rolled over and played dead. They were still firing their rockets up, they're still doing stuff in space, and they were able to put the first rover on the moon in November of 1970. Now this is an unmanned rover, but it uh, it's actually was a pretty effective vehicle. So it's about five feet in diameter. It, it looks almost like a, a bathtub on wheels, doesn't it? But it was actually quite good. So as a matter of fact, it lasted, it operated for 11 lunar days, which is 11 months. So it did a pretty good job. Now, if we're gonna send vehicle to the moon, we obviously have to be sure that before we send it, it won't break down the first time it runs over a rock, you know, or a, a bump. So we have to build some test models and we have to drive them around on a terrain that's similar to the moon. So this is what they did. They built this simulation area at Marshall Space Flight Center. So you can see these artificially created craters and there's some ridges there. And they had to put these vehicles through a torture test to see if in fact their engineering was, was adequate. They also had to have a vibration test unit to see if it would withstand the vibrations of flight, liftoff. So they had a total of eight engineering test models. Now, obviously, we've got to communicate. Uh, this is true whether we're on Earth or, or in space. We have to communicate. So one of the things we do is we carry along with us on the rover a low-gain antenna. And that is that device there with the handle on it. And there is our low-gain antenna right there. So the low-gain doesn't have to be pointed directly at Earth because it's a low-gain. Okay, It doesn't amplify a huge amount. But it is for voice communication and telemetry, especially from our suits and our suit systems and our health, our actually our biomedical uh, information. But we also have a data acquisition camera that was a 16 millimeter film camera so that the astronauts could record their activities so we could see what in the world they were doing and if they were making good use of, of our taxpayer uh, paid for equipment and so forth, okay? But we also need some way of transmitting TV pictures back to Earth. And at this time we had color TV. So on our rover, this is be the color TV camera over here. And this would be, this is looking kind of sick, but this is our high gain S-band antenna. 
like you see there. So since it's high gain, it must be pointed very accurately at the earth. And in order to do this, we could not move around while we were transmitting. So we had to stop, aim it at the earth, and then the people on the ground would control the TV camera until we were ready to start up again. Now the crew station has several things, but one the major thing is that control and display console there. Now ours um, is mostly dummy, it has a couple active switches, but this is a really important aspect of the rover, it's the, the brains if you will, the heart of it. So we have a couple of things here, we've got some monitors for battery temperature, motor temperature, we've got uh, monitors for battery voltage, amperage, we've got the main buses, and we've also got the nav system, the navigation system. Now if any of you know, um, does the moon have a global magnetic field, anybody? Well it does not. So that means we cannot use magnetic compasses up there. So what we have to do is use dead reckoning. So in the military or, or pilots, they use a lot of dead reckoning. So that means you have to use two things. It's essentially polar coordinates. You have to have an azimuth or bearing on a compass basically and you have to have range or distance, okay? So since they didn't have a global magnetic field, they had to use the alignment where the, the rover compared to the sun, there was a sun angle that you could measure, it would cast a shadow, you had to report that back to mission control and the roll and pitch angle and then they would cause you to torque your gyro, you could actually torque the gyro in there so that you were oriented with respect to geographical north on the moon, not, not magnetic north because there's not a global field. So geographical north on the moon and then you would have an odometer and a speedometer and you'd be able to tell how far you were going, what your azimuth was, your angle really, and then once you got to your location in order to get back in the military we used a back azimuth. So I don't know if you're familiar with this but if you are uh, heading on a, a azimuth of whatever it is, if it's less than 180 you add 180, if it's more than 180 you subtract 180 and that gives you your back azimuth and now you know how to get back. So that's essentially how they navigated. This is a T-handle joystick, we have one there. Uh, theirs had an active operational reverse inhibit switch that allowed them to actually drive in reverse. Ours, we just have a reverse, okay. But here's the interesting thing about the rovers on the moon. The great majority of the time, they did not use their reverse gear. They really didn't have an easy way of turning around and looking. There were no rear view mirrors. So rather than do that, before they got back on the vehicle, they would just pick it up and turn it around. Because on the moon, the rover only weighed 77 pounds. Kind of a unique way to do that, okay? But this allows you, just as ours does, allows you to steer left, right, accelerate forward, decelerate, stop, and go in reverse. So March 10th of 1971, this is really a milestone because <laughs> I, this doesn't happen very often, especially with government contracts. Boeing delivered the, this, the first rover two weeks ahead of time. How often does that happen, right? Two weeks early. Now, the bad news is the original cost for four flight models was 19 million. It ballooned to 38 million. Easy come, easy go, right? So the earth weight of the rovers was 462 pounds. They were 10 feet long, so that's the same size there. Only ours weighs 2,000 pounds here on earth. And the uh, device that attached it to the LEM was about 32 pounds. So there we meet our old friends, there's a Sam Romano, there's a Dr. Becker and uh, Pavlix. So they're sitting, uh, two of them, on the 1G rover in Santa Barbara. And this has rubber tires, okay? You can't have wire wheels with have this kind of weight. So they had rubber tires, but they had to be able to drive these things around and get kind of a feel for how they operated. So you might be wondering, okay, Einstein Jr., how in the world do you get this thing folded up on the spacecraft and then get it unfolded. Well, this is a simplified kind of way to, to show you. So the upper left, we see the astronaut pulling on a lanyard or two lanyards. On the upper right, we see the vehicle starting to be dropped down on the, the cables. And then the lower left, the wheels have popped out, at least the, the one end. And uh, then as they drop it further, the chassis begins to unfold, the front and the rear of the chassis unfold and lock into place. And then they set it on the ground they detach it from the LEM 
and they load it with equipment and drive it away. So that's basically the background and the story of the rover. And now we're going to talk about the mission. So on the left, we see Al Worden, who is rehearsing some of his mission activities in the command module simulator. But I got to feel bad for these guys here because Jim and Dave, in order to train, they had to go to Hawaii to train. What a bummer. So I feel really bad for them. So anyway, they have to practice with their geological recognition. They have to say, okay, yeah, that's a, that's a basalt rock, and that's a type of rock, and that's what we're looking for, so they could get to the moon and then know what they're looking for. Uh, if you notice, the camera that Jim has on his chest is a Hasselblad, but it's black. And that means that camera is not going to the moon. Okay, the ones that went to the moon were silvered. Okay, so that's going to stay here. So the day arrives, the big day, okay, July 26, 1971. These three guys here are just as excited as can be. And so at 9.34 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time from pad 39A, this is the liftoff of Apollo 15. And it takes about 12 minutes to get into orbit on a Saturn V. Now, I'm not going to say that nothing happened of note on the three days to the moon, but it really was essentially pretty trouble-free and nothing much happened that's worth reporting. But uh, they were on their way uh, three days. So on the 29th of July, they actually go into lunar orbit and uh, here's where you can see where they were supposed to land. That red arrow is where Apollo 15 was scheduled to land. That's where they did land. So you can see it's just, uh, just a hair to the east of that prime meridian. And then on the right, you see that red circle so if you're looking at those two big open areas, those smoothed out areas, those are seas or maria. They are impact basins that have been filled. So the mountain chain in between there is literally the terrain that got pushed up uh, as a result of those big impacts. So that's where they intend to land, in between the Sea of Serenity and the Sea of Rains. 30th of July, Scott and Irwin get inside their LEM, they named it to Falcon, for the Air Force mascot. So they begin their descent orbit initiation and then they initiate their power descent and power descent brings you to the surface. It's about a 12 minute engine burn as you see there in this artistic rendering. <clears throat> so at 6, 16 p.m. on that day, 30 of July, the spacecraft touches down on the moon and Scott says, okay Houston, the Falcon is on the plane at Hadley. And if you listen to that transcript, he is being very deliberate with his words, probably because he didn't want to screw it up in front of millions of listeners. But he's making a reference here to West Point, because at West Point, when they line up the cadets, they say the cadets are on the plane at Hadley. So this was kind of a tip of the hat to, to West Point. Now, this is a unique thing. For the first and only time during Apollo, a stand-up EVA was performed. So Dave Scott opens the top hatch, that's the, the docking hatch, stands on the ascent engine cover, and with a 500 millimeter telephoto lens, he stands outside the hatch looking through that, that uh, lens like a tank commander would do. For 33 minutes, he's looking at the terrain and deciding, okay, this is how we best approach that area and this is where we want to go. So that was a, a unique event. Nobody else had done that, nobody else did that. Kind of cool. So Davey boy, I got to make sure he's not behind me. So Dave uh, gets down the ladder, he jumps off the ladder onto the foot pad. And as he puts his left foot out on the surface, he says, as I stand out here in the wonders of the unknown at Hadley, I realize there's a fundamental nature or truth to our nature. Man must explore. And this is exploration at its greatest. Not really an overstatement. Not really an overstatement. So he's standing there saluting old, old, old glory. Now, if you're a former military and you're wondering why he's not standing at attention, he can't. The suit is not able to allow him to stand fully at attention. So he's, do he's doing the best he can, okay? But uh, there he is, uh, Jim Irwin taking this picture. Now Dave is going to take the rover for a ride, okay? And he's gonna test it out. So he gets on there and Jim Irwin is filming him but unfortunately, bad news. They don't have any front steering. And they don't know why. They just don't have any forward steering. So they're really disappointed and Dave calls back and says, I'm gonna miss that double Ackerman. I'm gonna miss it. 
But if you see at the bottom here, the maximum speed that any of our astronauts got on the moon with the rover was 10.5 miles per hour. Now you might think that's really kind of crawling, but actually in one-sixth Earth's gravity on the rough lunar terrain, they actually often got two wheels off the ground. So that's a pretty sporty ride, wouldn't you say? Pretty sporty ride. So here's a shot of Jim Irwin working at the back of the rover there, and he's uh, attending to the, the equipment pallet. He's either pulling some tools off or putting some on. But I want you to notice something. If you look behind the lunar module at that hill back there, <clears throat> it's probably what, maybe 20 feet back there or 30 feet? No. That hill is 14,000 feet tall. It's miles away. But on the moon, you can't tell. There's no scale markers. So when you see things, features on the moon, you have no idea how far away they are. You have no idea how big they are. You just can't tell. Pretty trippy. Pretty darn trippy. So now I'm not going to read all these experiments, but basically uh, on Apollo 15, the first J mission, we did actually add quite a few experiments that we had not carried with us before. So we wanted to expand on those. Now we did carry some that had been used before, like the solar wind composition experiment, the passive seismic experiment, lunar surface magnetometer had been done, uh, laser ranging retro reflector. On Apollo 11, the reflector they brought had 100 lenses. On this one, it had 300 lenses. So it was much more focused. But nonetheless, they got to their work and they got about it and they were able to employ and in place a lot of different experiments. And a lot of that was due to the fact the rover would take them around and they were able to do it easier. This is a shot, I don't know if that's Dave or Jim, but the next morning, believe it or not, the steering was fine on the front end. Now, when I say the next morning, don't be fooled because there was no night and then morning, okay? So the lunar day is 30 days long it consists of a two-week daytime and a two-week nighttime, so they, it never got dark while they were up there. It's just that they went inside and did their rest period, ate, and they slept, and then they came back out. To them, it was the next day. It was really the same lunar day, okay? So that's kind of funky there, but I just wanted to point that out. So they came back out. The thing had been sitting in the sun, and maybe, and nobody really knows why it was able to function after the first time, but it did. It worked just fine. They were kind of relieved, <laughs> but you know, they can do it with two-wheel steering. It's just that it's nicer with four-wheel. And by the way, and again, that terrain in the back, thousands of feet. Now Dave and Jim worked very, very hard, physically working very, very hard to do some of these experiments. So you see uh, Dave there, he's in placing a heat flow probe into one of the holes they have drilled with the drill. Oh. So they drilled a couple of holes and they were supposed to be 10 feet or three meters and they didn't always uh, hit that depth. The lunar regolith, the soil is very strange. It's very cohesive. Uh, the deeper you go, the harder it gets. So a couple of those core stems from the drill would get stuck in those holes. Now Dave Scott, when he was young, was a horse, okay? He was a physical specimen. He was a six footer, he was very strong, very, very athletic. And he tried, I don't know how many times to pull some of these core stems out. He sprained his shoulder trying to do that. This was very hard work. Jim Irwin, on one of the times he was outside, his drink bag, he had a, a, a water drinking pouch in his helmet and the straw was not able to function so he could not drink water. He got overheated, he got dehydrated, his electrolytes got low and he actually had irregular heartbeat and they believe now that perhaps this is why when he was 61 he died of that heart attack. They believe his heart was stressed by that activity on the moon where he got dehydrated. So this is very hard work. As a matter of fact, Dave also, when he got back, he had lost several fingernails because his fingers were so bruised by pushing against those gloves trying to do this work. Very, very hard work. This is a shot of one of them, I don't know which, 
and he's parked on the edge of what's called Hadley Rill. Now a rill is essentially a ravine or sometimes think of it as a canyon, a small canyon, but it's a good thing they didn't accidentally drive into Hadley Rill because it's a thousand feet deep. That would not be a good day. Probably wouldn't survive. Okay, even in one sixth Earth's gravity, you probably you've damaged your equipment enough, and you're not going to make it back. But kind of a neat idea. So Hadley Rill is a sinuous rill, or a very smoothly undulating rill, and scientists think that may have been caused by flowing lava, but they're not sure. There's Dave Scott, and he's using his Hasselblad camera, and he's looking at that. It's called a gnomon. It's a G N O M O N, and it is a size and color marker, a size and scale marker. So he's also holding on to an extension handle. But here's the other thing in the background, again, those look like hills you could just sort of run up and roll down. And again, uh, Mount Hadley is about 14, 15,000 feet. Now, you might also notice those bright spots up there, which of course are aliens. Uh, my bad. Uh, no, they're actually lens flares from the camera. That's what they are. But uh, we've been told they're, they're, they're aliens, so, so may, maybe you should look into that. Uh, anyway, while they're there, they collect the Genesis rock, and this rock was originally thought to be among the very oldest rocks on the moon. Now it's perhaps being reevaluated, maybe not quite so much. Uh, but anytime you use the word old, well, that's kind of a relative term. You have to kind of ex explicate that and sort of define that, what that means. So they had three traverses, one on each day. They started on the 31st of August. That EVA or traverse was about six and a half hours long. So if you look at the red, the red arrow, that's where the LEM was, that's where the spacecraft was parked. So EVA one is almost due south, down to elbow there, and then back up. Now if you see those numbers, those are the stations. That's a place where they stop the rover, get off, and sample, okay? Now EVA two, or sorry, yeah, EVA two with the first of August, over seven hours, and that is, again, almost due south, clear down to Spur, and then all the way back. And then today, 50 years ago, they did uh, Traverse three, and that was just under five hours, uh, due west to the edge of uh, Hadley Road, and then back. So a total of 17 miles they drove around. Uh, they didn't necessarily get 17 miles from the LEM but they drove a total of about 17 or about 30 kilometers. So as I say there, if you look at that diagram and those tick marks inside that circle would be indicating it's a depression, it's lower, so it's like a crater, or it is a crater. And of course that's north. Now these guys wanted to honor a lot of those people that had perished during the space race and they did not just want to honor Americans. And I think this is a really great sentiment. They also included the names of cosmonauts who had died on this plaque, the fallen astronauts. And then that little figurine, if you can see it, I wish I'd have put an arrow there, but there's a little, like a metal figurine that was created by a sculptor for this purpose, and they called it the fallen astronaut. And so they left it there face down to commemorate or honor all those people who had given their lives. And again, I think that's a wonderful idea. You don't just honor us, because those other people were trying really hard too, and our guys respected them and they respected us. They knew how hard it was and what it cost. Now, we've got a little bit of a film clip here from an experiment that Dave did on the moon. So this is one of those things that we are taught in school. We instinctively kind of intellectually say we know this, 
But how many times do you really see a validation of that in, right before your eyes? So this happening in 1971 on live TV was really something. That's really something. It really makes you think. It's like, wow, that really does happen, you know? Now this is one of the final shots of the rover, rover number one, and I'm not sure if it might be the last photograph they took of it, but nonetheless, this is uh, the day, the last day, they're getting ready to take off or getting ready to prepare to get back in the spacecraft. So they take a picture of this, and there are two things we're gonna mention about this. One, the TV camera had a problem with the clutch on the mechanism that, that uh, elevated it. So there's the camera kind of facing down. Now what they tried to do was set it up so when they parked it, it was far enough from the LEM that when the LEM took off, the people on the ground could follow the LEM up as it went up into orbit. Well, it didn't work too good on this mission because of that faulty clutch. <clears throat> it actually worked perfectly on Apollo 17. Nonetheless, the other thing is, if you ever see this picture again, you will know that this is rover number one. There's no big number one on it, so how do we know? Well, simply by looking at this. That is a Bible that was placed on the rover by Lieutenant Colonel James Benson Irwin. Leaned it up next to the T-handled joystick, and that Bible and that rover are still there today. So if you see this picture again, you see that little Bible there, you know that's rover number one. Pretty cool. Now, while Dave and Jim were down on the moon and they were playing in the dirt and getting all dirty and having a great time, uh, NASA did not expect uh, Al Worden to be up there eating sandwiches and playing video games or something. He was actually keeping very busy. So he had a lot of tasks to do, a lot of experiments to perform and a lot of photography to do. So he's up there and you see that kind of equipment area on that uh, service module, that is called the SIM bay, the Scientific Instruments Module Bay, and that was opened actually before they got to the moon, and that is how they conducted a lot of these experiments. Well, they're gonna be on their way back from the moon, and Alfred Worden is gonna get outside and do some work there. So here he is, the first what they call deep space EVA, they are in between the moon and Earth, and Al Worden gets outside for a total of 39 minutes. He has to recover some film cassettes from the service module because that service module isn't gonna come home intact. It's gonna burn up. So if they want that data, they've got to go out there and get that and bring it back inside the spacecraft. So that's what he's doing. He had a grand time out there. And again, this is the farthest that any human had been from Earth. Well, these guys get back and they make entry interface at 400,000 feet, that's they begin their re-entry uh, on the 7th of August, and at 400,000 feet, their speed is still about 6.8 miles per second. That's, you can say that a number of ways, you can say 36,000 feet per second, you can say it's about 10 kilometers per second, you can say 24,000 miles an hour. So as a result, that spacecraft heat shield, this is why it looks the way it does, it comes through 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit heat of re-entry. That's a little hotter than your French fries, okay? But when they got through the atmosphere and their chutes deployed, uh, and they're not exactly sure why this happened, uh, there's been some speculation, one of their chutes uh, failed to stay open and they hit the water a little harder than they had planned, uh, a little faster, so instead of hitting it at about 22 miles an hour, they hit it at about 20, almost 25 miles an hour, a little bit rough, but the spacecraft was designed to land under two if necessary, so it wasn't a big problem. The total mission length was over 12 days, 12 days and seven hours. They are picked up by the USS Okinawa, which those of you who have been in the Navy or familiar with ships, uh, it is an LPH, so it has Marines and helicopters on it. And so these guys are sitting there in the boat. Notice if you can, that they are not wearing any special garments. There are no more restrictions. There are no more quarantine procedures. Uh, the moon is, is in fact sterile, we, we know that. And so they didn't have to worry about any of that. And on the right, they're getting out of the helicopter on the deck of the ship. And if you look closely, they, I think they need a shave. <laughs> and they didn't care. So uh, the maximum radial distance, as we said, uh, that they drove was about 17 and a half miles. Now this, some of these, um, superlatives are only including up to this mission and not after. So a couple of the later missions, the two missions that came after, they did some of these a little bit more than this, but 
So they had three lunar EV surface EVAs and one uh, stand-up EVA. Uh, so 18 hours, 37 minutes. They brought back 170 pounds of rocks and soil. That's quite a bit. Longest Apollo mission up to that point. These guys were the first, and I, I don't know if actually the other two did this, they placed an orb, an into orbit around the moon a satellite. And it was a scientific satellite that didn't last very long, but it was designed to pick up information about the moon. And that had never been done before. And of course, as we said, the first deep space EVA, uh, depending on how you define that, I'm, you know, to me, being inside uh, lunar orbit, it's, is it really deep space? I, I don't know but it's the farthest from Earth anyone has ever gotten outside a spacecraft. So that's pretty, uh, pretty in intense. So at this point, um, I thank you very much, and if you have questions, I will certainly entertain them at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes? Compensate for the weight of the rover. Did they have to give up anything else on the... Uh no, they didn't. As a matter of fact, they increased the payload because they were able to tweak the engines of both the, the LEM and the rocket, the Saturn V. They were able to get more thrust out of them. So, yep. Yeah. So, for example, uh, the LEM on Earth for Apollo 11 weighed about 33,000 pounds. The LEM on this mission weighed about 36,000 pounds. So they were able to tweak the propulsion system and remove some unnecessary ullage motors and retro rockets on the Saturn V so they could make accountability for that. Yep. Who, who else? Anybody have a question? No one has a question? Really? Did I put somebody to sleep? Yeah. Was the, uh, was the navigation on the rover the same as the navigation was in the LEM? No, it could not be. So the LEM had an onboard digital computer and an inertial guidance system with three gimbals, so it was very highly advanced. Uh, the LEM uh, could do that because it's flying through space. Once you land on the moon, you cannot use any kind of a magnetic compass or any kind of a inertial guidance system. It had to be too, it had to be light and it had to be reliable and, and, and simple. So they just used that um, dead reckoning. And it worked just fine. Worked just fine. Uh